You see up on the, the screen now as we begin this, uh, that passage from, oh my, what happened to my screen here? The passage from 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11, or th chapter 13, uh, about God's love that never fails. And that is God's love. It comes from this particular passage in 1, thir thir 1 Corinthians 13, chapter 8. Let's slow down. Um, I have to preface this a bit, though. I've, I've used these, these passages from 1 Corinthians 13, often known as the love chapter, for most every wedding that I've done. I have a couple, they come in, I counsel them, and, and then I say, when we start to prepare for the service, I say, well, I'm going to read some scripture, and I'll give you some choices. And I'll give a handful, typically, of five, six different passages to read. And undoubtedly, this is the one chosen. The 1 Corinthians 13 passage is about true love. And that's important. It is great love. It is uh, uh, the kind of love that is uh, perfect. But you've got to kind of look at this love in context. For Paul began a message to the Corinthian church that actually started in chapter 1, but it got intentional in chapter 12. In chapter 12, Paul began to teach them about uh, the Holy Spirit, about spiritual gifts, and that they all have gifts, and it's one spirit that unites them throughout, but it's, but it's the same spirit. And here's a little sampling of that from chapter 12. And just like a body has many parts, they're all functional for the body. But they work together. The ideal way for this body to work together is for everything that God has given, gifted me with, that it functions well. Now, there's times that my back doesn't feel very well. There's times that I have a headache. There are times when parts of my body are functioning better, like my mind, than other times. But they're still working together. And Paul prefaces chapter 13 then with the body working together for one unified purpose through the presence of the Holy Spirit. And that's God's love. Then he lands on chapter 13 and says, now... Now, it's love that binds all this together. It's love that makes all this work perfectly. Because if anything that we can say about God is what? If you want to answer, if people ask you, well, tell me about God. If you just simply say God is love, you've given the right answer. You've given the right answer because God simply is true love. Now, not the kind of love that, that sometimes we think about here on earth, and I'll get to that in a moment. But sometimes we're like this. We have God's way and we separate it to man's way. Now, God's way, his love never ends. Man's love can, what? Separate, right? It can have issues. It can have some problems along the way. And we don't always model that 1 Corinthians 13. And in fact, I put the Proverbs scripture up there. It's one of my favorite Proverbs, 14, 12. It says, there's a way that seems right to a person, but at the end it leads to death. And Paul is saying, Corinthian church, you've tried to do this on your own. You thought this was the right way, but I'm, I'm going to tell you now it's not. I'm going to tell you not. You need to care about each other, love about each other unconditionally. So he goes through this whole thing and lays a great foundation for what he's going to talk about in ver chapter 13. So whenever I do these weddings, I've left out so often, I just kind of skim on the highlights. Nobody wants to hear that. 30-minute sermon and then the wedding from Pastor Greg. They want, you know, all right, just you know, get on, get to the I do and the, um, you know, and let me have the kiss and we'll get out of here. We'll get going with life. And that's, and we forget about taking, placing God at the center of everything. And that's where this love, this love truly does. It places God at the center of everything. Um, in fact, first Corinthians, at, um, going back to this one, well, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 13 says, Paul kind of boils it down here. He says, and now there, these three things remain after he netted it all out. He said, there's faith, there's hope, and love. But the greatest of these that binds it all together is love. And that's one of the most more famous verses of the whole chapter. In fact, whenever I was working, walking out this morning and headed back to my office looking for something, I looked up on the coat rack and I found this. 
And I know I'd seen this here in the church before, but I forgot about it. Love never fails. So if we are the church, we don't want to ever fail, right? So the embodiment of who we are should be grounded in what Paul's telling us here. It should be grounded in love for God and love for one another. Unconditional love. Okay. Now, let's pray before we go on to see God's Word in 13. Lord, uh, uh, this is some, these are some special words that, that are a great reminder to us this morning <coughs> of your unconditional nature of love, of how you want to pour that into each of us, that begins to change us. Lord, send a word, a message to each one of us today about your very nature this morning through these great words of Scripture, I pray. Amen. Um, 1 Corinthians 13, 1-3. Paul talks about some things here. Uh, he names five spiritual gifts. We'll look at it. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels... But do you not have love? I'm just a gong. I'm just a mouthpiece. I'm just, you know, it's just hot air, if you want to call it that way. A clanging cymbal. And that can be annoying, can it? If I am only, if I have the gift of prophecy, another gift, and can fathom all mysteries and knowledge, another gift. And if I have faith, another gift, that I can move mountains. I got that kind of faith. But I don't have love. I'm nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor, so if I'm the most charitable person on earth, if I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may, that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. So I can, have, I can be the best of all things. I can look the best on the outside. I can be as shiny and squeaky clean and look the most pious person on earth. But if I'm really just doing it to go through the motions or in an uncaring way, I gain nothing. Paul is speaking the truth in love. Ephesians 4.15 Speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of Him who is the head, that is, in Christ. We need to speak the truth in love. Sometimes there are folks who might be doing things that are harmful to one another or to the church. Sometimes you have to speak the truth in love. Sometimes that's hard to do. Sometimes that's a, a tough message to give to somebody. But to sit down and say, and don't, don't, I, I don't encourage anyone to ever say, well, God told me to tell you this. That doesn't work. But truly, begin, begin to gently share that God loves them more than anything else. And God cares about what's going on in our church or in our lives. And He wants to be at work within that. And we need to wait upon Him at times to do that. I, I meet with someone every week. And, and uh, this, this gentleman had some hard news to tell someone in his church that he was having a difficult time. And he, he saw, we, we talked about that for about a month before he did it. And kind of developed a strategy to do that. And, and um, this past week, he had the opportunity to sit down with that person. And I think it was received a whole lot better because the message was given in love. It truly was a, passionate, a passion that this guy had for the church. And yet, he, he knew that he needed to say what he needed to say. And he did that in love. And, and that's what we need to do. Speak truth, but always do so in love. So what kind of love is it that God pours into each of us? It's something that, that we call agape love. The agape love is, was, only, was a word that was, began in the New Testament. It's not an Old Testament word. It's an unconditional love. And it's the love that, that Jesus did, died for us over or through when he died on the cross for our sins. To offer us the word grace. Or offer, the, offer us the, the thought of grace and the way of grace which comes into the relationship. And it's an agape love. There's you know, you've been, I remind you that there's different kinds of love. There's filial love, the brotherly love that Philadelphia is named after. Um, I'm not so sure that city always embodies that. Uh, there is the eros love, the more erotic type love, the physical type love that, that 
people connotate the word to more than anything else. And, uh, and there's the agape love. And I think I'm leaving out one, one more, and I'm losing my train of thought this morning on that. But anyway, uh, the, the agape love is a selfless love. It's a selfless love where we like try to remove our very self but offer everything poured into the other. And the, the most common way to think of that is, is this. It's the cross. The, the cross of, of Christ that He offered His love for each of us when He died on Calvary that He cared about us. And when we think of 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, it says, Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. That's his very nature, is to love us. Um, that's why, I think that's why Paul began this message back in chapter 12 with the thought that God instills that into each of us with the gift of the Holy Spirit. We tend to go on our own. Remember the, the Proverbs that I shared with us. There's a way it seems right to man. And sometimes we look to our own self instead of looking to see what God's model of love is, which was the cross. Now, we move on from that passage into the, the words that I always have shared at weddings. And this is, these are those words. And I'm sure everybody here embodies these words, especially the first one. Love is what? Patient. Can we stop and just go say, I'm working on that one. Uh, love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. Anybody married? <laughs> and that's what this Sunday is not about couples either. Don't get at that. It's, it's about God's unconditional love that we should model for one another and for everyone. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres, gets through the thick and the thin. And I like it better in one of the versions that says, what can be said about this love is that this love never fails. Human love tends to fail, right? We tend to have breakdowns. We tend to have divorce. We tend to have separation. We tend to have fights. We tend to have anger that festers and and seems to um, just drive wedges between relationships. God's love, could, would you ever say that God's love will ever do that? No. It will never ever do that. It will never fail. And these key words, are, these are the key ingredients that we could take into our personal lives to help us. So there's eight things that love is. Patient, kind, truth, protects, trusts, hopes, perseveres, and it never fails. Hmm. Can you check off any of those? <laughs> Are you good at all those? Uh, probably one, you know, maybe you're a superstar at. Maybe one, you're, it's, you're under construction. Maybe one, you know, I'm, I'm a train wreck on that one. I don't know. Uh, you kind of have to look at where you're at on each one of those. And there's eight things that love is not. To just take it the other way. It's not envious. doesn't boast or be prideful. It's not rude. It's not self-seeking. It's not about my interests first. doesn't get angry. doesn't ever hold grudges. doesn't ever delight in evil. But rejoices in truth. So love is patient. Got to talk about that one for just a moment. That comes from two Greek words that means long and tempered. So you have a long, long tempered. In other words, it's self-restraint. It shows some self-restraint. I think you have to work at patience a bit. And it's, it's kind of like the opposite of anger. Um, it, it's... Sometimes when we're patient, we have to remind ourselves to pull back, to hold back. Some, uh, some people have a short fuse, don't they? You're one of those? You probably know somebody that has a short fuse. You yourself don't have that. We don't have to retaliate. We don't have to bite back. We can be patient with everything. 
We can hold back. So, we don't have to have a short fuse. We can hold everything back. 1 Peter 5, verse 6, uh, 6 and 7 says, Therefore, humble yourselves, it's a good way to begin, under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you at the right time. That might not be the right time where you need to let go. Casting all your anxiety on Him in the meantime because He cares for you. There's a place to go. So, it's patient. It's kind. You know, in 1 Corinthians 10, 33, Paul says, I too try to please everyone in everything I do. I don't just do what is best for me. I do what is best for others so that many may be saved. So your kindness is noticed. Kindness, at all, the Greek word of that means to show yourself as useful to one another. Your kindness is poured out and poured into others. Another one is don't be envious. The dog is green with envy, right? For that bone that looks better than the one that he has. I think there's a commandment about that as well. Um, envy comes from a word that means to boil. To boil. And it's, you know, it's, you, it just boils up inside of you. Do you get to the point and say, you know, it's got to be, I want that for me. It's that me mentality when we want something, when we're envious of something that somebody else has. I know you're probably all envious of my heart-shaped tie this morning and want that for yourself. So we, we are envious at times. Love does not boast. Boasting. You know, it's, it's being a braggart. Nobody wants to be around that person. Play the part of the braggart. You, want, you know, it's simple in that one. Love is not proud. Pride. Pride can get in the way. Pride leads to the fall. Pride can always get us in trouble in our life. Um, it puffs us up. It makes us look, try to be somebody that we're not. Our self-important, you know, we, our, our hat won't fit our big heads anymore. I think so much pride, boasting, those kind of things can lead to the mentality we have in a lot of our schools these days about bullying. It seems so prevalent. Also, love is not rude. Rude means unshapely. Not pretty to look at. When somebody's rude, it's not a pretty sight, is it? I, I think some of these in today's environment of the, um, of the talk where we brought about the Me Too and all that, have this, this problem has manifested itself so much in our society that we've seen far too much of this get out of, get out of control. These kind of behaviors which has led to this. I mean, you know, some of the talk that, that takes place at times doesn't need to be there. We need to rethink some of our actions, some of our ways. Um, and some who haven't are getting caught up into that at this day, this day and age. Love is not self-seeking. One should not worship themselves. The world does not revolve around each of us. Love is not easily angered. Not easily angered. Kind of the opposite of patient. It holds back. Love keeps no record of wrongs. And this is where God's nature really comes in. That our sins, God remembers no more. He keeps no record of this. And proof of that is found in, um, in Scripture. If you go back and look at um, Psalm 130, verse 3, it says, If you, O Lord, kept a record of our sins, who could stand? God keeps no records of our wrongs. We come truly with a repentant heart to, to Him, which we will do in our ashes service on Tuesday night. Love does not delight in evil with rejoices, but rejoices in the truth. Amen. Truly, we should be truthful to one another as the Scripture moves on in this. Does not delight in evil. But love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. This kind of love never fails. And you probably think at times I'm looking at this with rose-colored rose glasses, but I'm not. That's really the embodiment of, of what God thinks we can do. The embodiment of, of His nature that we are to model in our life as we deal with one another. True love never fails. Let's pray. God, we give thanks for this passage. Lord, I think we oftentimes pass over it thinking that that's an impossibility but you gave it to us. 
Lord, I ask you to, to touch each of our hearts here today. To mold it to men, to change, to receive into our lives the patience that we need. To let us get rid of some of the anger, some of the, the pent-up frustrations that we might carry with us that should not remember some of the wrongs that have been against us, but truly remember that it's grace that saves us and grace that needs to be offered to others. That we should offer forgiveness and love. So Lord, uh, I give thanks for this special gift that you gave to us in this passage from Paul and that we might live it out in each of our lives. Amen.